Welcome to Burning Platforms, a fortnightly podcast from the Australia Institute's Centre for Responsible Technology. I'm Peter Lewis, the Director of the Centre. This week, we dive deep into the world of dark advertising with Nicholas Carra from the School of Communications and Arts at the University of Queensland and Amy Brownbill from the Foundation for Alcohol Research and Education. But first, our wrap of the latest tech news with Digital Rights Watch Chair Lizzie O'Shea and Guardian Australia Managing Director Dan Stinton. And away we go. Today, we're talking about AI-generated art and if I'm a bit slower than normal in, um, and that's hard because I'm pretty slow normally in, in holding this show together, it's because I've had a bit of a sleepless night because at about 11 o'clock last night, Lizzie sent me a, a Twitter thread about AI art who, and she introduced me to Loeb. Now, Loeb is a computer generated image, which is said to be Um, colonising the internet, i.e. when people are entering search words, this lovely visage is coming up. I'm just going to share my screen. If you're listening on the pod, this will be a bit empty, but just go and Google Loeb. That's Loeb, Dan. Ain't she pretty? (laughs) Tell us about Loeb and how how Loeb came into being. Sure. Yes, and thanks to Lizzie for ensuring that both me and Pete had very little sleep last night um, because there's quite a few images that get much worse than this, let me tell you. Um, So, yeah, look, this came about last week. um, A Swedish uh, artist called Super Composite claimed to have stumbled across the sort of persistent image, if you like, of a very spooky-looking woman um, that she named Loab. Um, If you want to Google that, it's L-O-A-B, while messing around with some some AI image-generating software. She doesn't say what software. I'll come back to that in a second. So she claims that this started back in April when Super Composite was experimenting with what she called negatively weighted prompts. So in other words, she was asking the AI to produce sort of the, the opposite, if you like, of a concept. And she started out firstly with, okay, show me the opposite of what Marlon Brando looks like. Uh, and at first, um, kind of perplexingly, it, it produced a logo of the city skyline. But then when she asked the AI to produce the opposite of that, instead of it then going back and showing an image of Marlon Brando, it instead produced that withered old woman with spooky eyes and red cheeks that, um, that we just saw, um, which is pretty disturbing, I guess, but, um, you know, uh, whatever. And then, and then but things got really interesting when she started to combine this with other image prompts. So she said, okay, well, show me love in a room bathed in light or, or holding a children's toy. And instead of that making the image less spooky, it made it worse and it, it became increasingly horrifying. So Loeb, there's images of, her with blood dripping from her eyes, holding children with severed heads and splattered with blood. It's really pretty nasty stuff. And apparently Supercomposite doesn't really know why this came about uh, or why Loeb's image is persistent, but um, it, it basically came about from sort of the imagination of the AI software that she was using, which was drawing on images from the internet. Um, so kind of drawing on, I guess, um, sort of the human experience uh, that's captured online. And what's interesting about this, I'd love to hear your take on it, Lizzie, and yours, Peter, but what's interesting about this is now that this has taken off and it's being shared by so many people on social media and everywhere else, there's even more images of her. So she's kind of, she's impossible to kill now. She's just basically just going to be living online forever and potentially being recreated and, and persisting in other AI software. So um, uh, I want to talk about the software that she used to create it in a second, but before I do, um, Lizzie, why did you share this with us? Because <laughs> she's cruel. <laughs> Because I was freaked out and I wanted other people to be freaked out as well. Yeah, I think it is so interesting. Like when you ask some uh, a machine to produce the opposite of something, what it tells you about the original concept as well as what we consider to be opposites. I mean, I just keep thinking, is like a woman who's unattractive and scary and um, harming children, is she the opposite of the opposite of uh, a vision of masculinity that, that comes to your mind when you think of Marlon Brando? Like, is this what people find frightening? I mean, I don't know whether I'm reading too much into the AI, but, you know, there was a researcher, I remember, who was talking about um, a similar kind of project, analysing data from uh, Rate My Professor, actually, about, you know, the differences between male and female professors. And he said what we should use these projects for is to not tell us what we should be, but um, tells us about ourselves, analysing this kind of big data and these trends. And in some ways, that's what I feel like Loeb is doing, telling us about ourselves, what 
uh, what we fear, but and and perhaps in ways that we hadn't even fully understood ourselves. I may be reading too much into the AI, though. So you know, that's that's um, my suspicion too. I don't want to um, anthropomorphize the uh, the system itself if that's a, a possibility. So yeah, that's the first thing that sprung to my mind. That the most one of the most horrifying images from our vision of positive masculinity in Marlon Brando twice removed is possibly a very frightening mm. word, version of femininity. <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a great article that um, we've shared around as well that we'll put in the chat in a sec once I get off my screen share. But the other thing that struck me reading about it was there's been all sorts of scary memes and images that have been pushed out over the web, but this seems to be the first one that's been wholly generated by a mashup of images that's been developed by the AI itself and I find Mm. that remarkable and this whole idea that then it's creating its own momentum the more times and we're obviously adding to it as well if we if we share it and build the vibe around it but um it'll be interesting to see where low ends up and um what the what the casualty rate is at the end of it but Dan Mm. do you want to move into the broader piece about AI art because then we want to go back to some of the work Lizzie's been doing and researching how it works Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, what's what's um, interesting about the timing of this is that it, it's come about this week, which is about a week or two after this new AI image generating tool was was released uh, called Stable Diffusion. Um, and, and look, essentially, what this tool does, uh, similar to what we've just been talking about, is it allows people to produce images or pictures from any text prompt. So, for example, you could ask it to produce um, a futuristic city, you know, inside a huge transparent glass dome, and it can produce that. Yeah, pretty in about 10 seconds or you could say a cartoon fox of a path you know in, in or a fox on a path in a green field that can produce that in about the same amount of time um so this is pretty similar to open ai's dali which uh some people might be familiar with the exception this time though is that the entire application is open source and able to be downloaded to any machine with a decent gpu so that means pretty much anyone if they've got any tech savvy at all can, and only a really limited amount can can do what they want with it it works by drawing on uh, I think it's the Lion 5B image set, I think it's called, which is which is basically a huge um, image scrape of about 5 billion publicly accessible images from the internet. So basically draws on the internet to, to create these things. And look, on the one hand, this is amazing. I mean, it, it has the potential um, to make it easy for almost anyone to create whatever images they want and, and soon videos, I'm sure. But we've already started to see this going off the rails with stable diffusion being used to create nude images and porn images of celebrities who have no idea that this is happening, no control over it. And these have basically started to spring up on on 4chan and everything else. And you can see just the potential for this to go wrong in the deep fake territory is massive because you can then also be be using this, like millions of people could potentially be using this to create deep fakes of politicians saying or doing things that obviously they haven't done and that could be distributed across the internet. It's already hard enough for people to know what's real and what's not since everyone became a publisher. This is just going to make that on steroids. So it's pretty concerning. And once again, I think it's an example. While I think this tech is amazing, it's another example of the tech being released into the wild and where all the giant experiments. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway. So Lizzie, you jumped on and did a little bit of research. Do you want to share what you, what you found? I'll just yeah, share my yeah. screen so again. Yeah, yeah. So I, of course, <laughs> put in some prompts for looking for some images to describe what we're doing today. So this, I think, is a um, two men and a woman making a podcast in Australia about technology. I think, or in Australia, yeah, in Australia about tech, which I think is a pretty good job. I mean, I'm. Why is one of the guys sucking his cord, or is that just uh, the way it's? But the other I'm, one's I'm even a, more disturbing, as yeah, you described. Yeah, well, I think, I think I said, the last one I think I, I must confess was three people making a podcast. This one I said two two men and a woman. And then the whoever's, which one of you two is the guy in the middle appears to have a vagina on his face. It's extremely <laughs> weird. One of them looks very confused, though, which I think is quite similar to Peter at the start of this show. That's true. Week, and so. I, I'm quite, and the woman's I'm quite got, cheery, but, yeah, but, but half but out also, of the picture as well, which sort of oh. says a bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. Anyway. Well, I'm immediately copywriting that. So if anyone wants to use it, just ask me for the um, for the rights. Um, but yeah, well, I would recommend also if people haven't read um, checking out Atlas for a- of AI by um, by Kate Crawford, who's a researcher in this field, because she talks about actually like some of the data sets that are used to train these machines, and it is actually really interesting because you know the imagery and stuff. That's a that's a that's a curated collection of images. Like it's not a neutral data set. It's what we think is is important. So what's gone online? There'll be biases inherent in that that reflect social trends and and underlying um, structures and then also how those are classified like and how difficult it can be to classify some of those images does then give 
in, uh, further um, shadows of bias over all of these processes that we can, these pr are produced like in this neutral format and we trust them. But in fact, there's a huge uh, amount of work that's gone on behind the scenes that is subject to the influences of humans. And she goes through that quite carefully uh, using a couple of examples. And I think that that's probably how we ought to think about, about these kinds of programs as well, not... Um, yeah, not neutral, but human creations of humans. But there is a copyright consideration in this as well, right? Because the, the AI is drawing on images which people have created. I mean, if you're a designer or a photographer or whatever at the moment, you, this is very quickly going to make you redundant as the tech improves, I would have thought. Like, it's a pretty yeah. scary process. But it's pastiching, isn't it? At the moment, it's pastiching. So there, your avatar did not have a, a real vagina on their head. That was the mashup of the different. I'm glad parts that was my the no. See, it was, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I know the great question in intellectual property law used to always be the example. Was, I always thought it was um, that monkey that took it, a selfie of itself. Like, who owns the copyright to that? The guy who holds the camera or whatever. And here it's a different question, I suppose. Like, I don't know whether Mickey Mouse appears in these, but you know, like Disney has very strong interest in protecting um, intellectual property rights over mm. imagery and does a lot of work to do that. And then. You do wonder whether scraping images yeah. off the internet is going to be something they resist or, you know, with these data sets, are, like there's ethical concerns about them, but obviously also they may confront legal problems with, with yeah. heavily interested parties. This may well be a topic at NFT Fest, which we were going to talk to um, in a little while. But before we get there, either you or Henry want to talk about the use of um, facial recognition and biometric testing in schools, Lizzie? Yeah, I just want to raise this as a story because um, we got a bit of media. My colleague at Digital Rights Watch, Sam Floriani, was talking about this. There's a school in Sydney that has implemented a regime where where um, students can't use the bathroom unless they use their fingerprint to enter. And um, I find it pretty astonishing that, that this was permitted to, to happen. The school says in their defence that they've engaged in considerable consultation with, with families and the like and, um, you know, that their system is secure for a bunch of different reasons. But the reality is that's biometric information about children that's being collected and then uh, being used <laughs> in, I think, a pretty privacy-invading way, like uh, the capacity to be able to use the bathroom. I don't know. I, I don't understand why we need anything like this to be able to monitor that. The school says there was problems with vandalism and stuff, and there's just it's an instance of um, sophisticated tech being deployed where I, I really think a pen and paper could have done the same job, you know? And so, uh, anyway, I, I was sort of shocked that it had gotten this far, and it did confirm to me just how much of a lot of these developments in tech and real-life uses of them, particularly in the biometric field tend to be vendor driven i can imagine this is a program that's pushed um, as a solution to a problem that is kind of created by the industry itself um, and yeah i think we should really think carefully about whether data collection of this kind is legitimate whether there's alternatives that exist that are non-technical um, and and you know also the rights of children to be able to go about their lives without being washed, watched all the time and not be inculcated into a culture of mm. surveillance, which I think is the big objection. Well, I don't know. Is anybody else as stunned as me about this? Well, I I'm not stunned that it's been rolled out under the justification of child safety because it's a really you know, and you can see why a parent would be concerned about what goes on in a toilet block if your kid's at school, but then it's also a bit of a rites of passage. That's where you used to have your ciggies and things. So I don't know. Like, I I, I, I do agree with your point that it appears a vendor-driven solution to a problem that may not actually need a tech solution but just needs a process put in place. Um, you then think about rolling that out into workplaces where, you know, the monitoring of toilet breaks is a legitimate thing. Um I and then you take it to the next step that it's not just the toilet it's every movement inside the school and all of a sudden you've expanded the surveillance state um all with the greatest of intentions but it kind of you can see how it can become all consuming very very quickly I don't know what do you reckon Dan oh, look I'm not sure I've got much to add and it just it feels like surveillance it is surveillance it's once again using tech which is increasingly cheap and easy to use for surveillance for purposes that uh, I mean, look, again, as usual in isolation, look, I'm sure the intention of this is good. I'm sure there's a vandalism problem and this will probably solve that problem. But do we really want our kids to be under surveillance, um, like one more step of being under surveillance for this? And the answer is no. I just don't think that it's worth it. And I think if you've got a problem, to your point, Lizzie, if you've got a problem with 
vandalism in your toilets, then there are better offline ways of managing that than just relying mm. on a surveillance technique. Yeah. And James has made a really good point in, in the chat, having worked in the education system about the concern of schools' capacity to hold that data. So legitimate question, is that data then being held by the school or going back to the mothership so that, you know, I don't know how they'd use yeah. toilet data, whether they're mm. quite trying to sort of map the continents of Australian children or whatever. But. Well, what they say also with these fingerprints is they create a, um, a kind of fingerprint of the fingerprints, so to speak, and then delete the actual fingerprint. But there is still this data that's being collected and potentially um, there's points of access for these systems, right? So if you had this everywhere, you could, and, and you've used an off-the-shelf off product, uh, the data is travelling through space and people can... Um, break into these systems yeah, who aren't supposed yeah. to be there. Now, query whether anyone wants to do that, right, for this kind of data. But the more ubiquitous these systems are, the more um, sensitive the data that is collected, uh, the greater the incentive for criminal kind of hacking, and the more we're reliant on companies that do offer this service to places like schools to do a good job of protecting these systems. And I don't think we can be sure of that. And with biometrics, once that data is gone, it's gone. You know, it's not like you can change it like a password. And these are decisions being made about children very early in their lives. And to my mind, it just seems wholly unethical. Um, yeah, look, it regardless also of whether the parents can send it's a bit of that panopticon effect as well, isn't it? That if you're setting up a surveillance, you... you you think you're going to control behaviours because of the risk of being monitored and policed rather than creating behaviours that are healthy for kids, right? Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. This is the other reason why I hate Elf on the Shelf, you know, that uh, that toy that watches you all the time. Like, I'd, I just think we shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't be... Haven't got one for Henry yet? <laughs> I don't even have a monitor. I just use my offline ears. Um, but, you know, like, I think it is really important to... To, we're going to have to talk to children about how to navigate living in a society full of surveillance. We shouldn't just ignore it. Uh, we should be having discussions with them about it, what it means, both in terms of, you know, the big political questions, but also in terms of how you want to live your life engaging with some of these companies that will dominate your existence and how can you be more intentional in what you do and avoid being manipulated by them. Like the answer is not just to go with the flow and, and increase the amount of surveillance we put kids uh, we make kids subject to, in my view. It's about, it should be about having those kinds of discussions. Anyway. Excellent. Okay. Well, on that note, we might move to the last offering, which is mine, which is I got an invite, well, someone emailed it on to me anyway, to NTF Fest, which is going to be held in Melbourne in November. And I've put a link there. And as people know, I'm pretty sceptical about the whole NFT world, but I did spend a bit of time last night having a look at some of the presentations from last year's NFT Fest, which was the first. Um, so this is for those that aren't across the um, acronyms Non-Fungible Token Fest, which is the idea that there is um, unique digital um, assets that people can trade into. And on one level... I absolutely hate everything I saw in the presentations. Um, and I'm, not to be mean, because I'm raising this to question my own assumptions as well, but there was a session, a session called Monetizing the Meme Economy that you can watch. And it's um, pe people from, you know, companies like Yieldly, um, which is all about creating value across disparate communities. And they talk a lot about communities and they talk a lot about value. And, what I worked out watching it is that they build communities around other people that have bought non-fungible to tokens to talk about how much value they might get out of it one day. Um, they talk about crypto punks, which are like particular assets you can buy. Um, and the whole thing has this kind of zen-like millennial um, alchemy about it that these people are sitting on a gold mine if only everybody else worked out. So maybe I'll go. I don't know. Um, I, I want to be really careful about just bagging people who are obviously passionate about their stuff, but it does seem to be a case of latching onto the new thing and then looking for a purpose for it. So, and, and shouldn't tech be the opposite way around where we identify problems and then work out how we can address it with tech. So I know I sent you the the talking sushi guide, Lizzie. What was your, are you going to go to NFT Fest if invited? I feel like we should go together, Peter, because someone's got to be there to make fun of them. I don't know. This is a weird cult dynamic, I think. There's a whole movement of this on Twitter as well where they all talk about this. There's a very famous, oh, very famous, there's an interview with uh, 
Oh, God, who's the late night host in Paris Hilton where they talk about exchanging their NFTs? And it's extremely weird because it does sort of feel like you're being sold the pup. And, and the whole purpose of this is to talk about a community when, in fact, it's about making money off your NFTs. I did look up that Twitter, the first um, tweet by Jack Dorsey uh, that was sold, I think people may recall, for over $2 million. I saw a headline the other day that it had sold for nothing. <laughs> um, and so part of the thing I think about NFTs is it's like this Ponzi scheme where the whole thing only continues if you can find a, a chump to sell it to and that's that's its value. It's not actually, it doesn't hold any intrinsic value outside of it. Um, I, do, I do think there's some danger in this. You know, we saw with these speculative markets uh, like with cryptocurrencies, there's a lot of people who invest a lot and then potentially lose their life savings and it, it can be really problematic, obviously, for those people and, and there's a bit of flippancy about how we treat these things and um, I, I do want to make sure that we acknowledge that I suppose that it can cause real harm I think having um, everyday people come into these markets without fully realizing the danger of them um, and there are whales wandering around kind of profiting off mm. that ignorance shall we say or um, naivety and yeah that that makes me feel pretty mad about it all it does seem like it's a bit of a financialization of everything coupled with rich people making money off oh. of people they perceive as um, mm. stupider than them but look I, I'd be interested to go and have a look and have a, yeah. a laugh so Dylan's made the point that um, Pokemon cards, the original NFT, the Washington Post also reported this week that um, ISIS is your Islamic, Islamic State are using ah! non-fungible tokens um, to spread um, their terror message. The NFT visible on at least one trading site entitled IS News bears Islamic State regalia. And so I don't know if people are investing in... Um, in that as well um dan you're not as skeptical like i don't know i'm not going to call you a chump but dan do you want to buy the oh, nft okay. for that image for that i made in um stability diffusion or well, obviously i'd right? love to buy that I'd love to i'll buy give that. it two and a half million that's what I'm... <laughs> look as usual uh you libby and you peter have me surrounded uh because i think this technology is really interesting and i think um well hang on let, let me let me give a bit more of a measured response i agree with i think the point that you made libby which is there is way too much hype around NFTs. And as a consequence of that, there's a whole bunch of largely very bad art, which is being sold uh, to lots of people who perhaps should have known better for um, a whole bunch of money that it didn't deserve to be sold for. Um, and it, but it's not that, it's not, it's not dissimilar from sort of the start of the internet and then the start of internet 2.0 as well. There was lots of um, hype and scams and those sort of things that came about at that, at that point. And I think the difference with, Web3 and NFTs broadly this time is that the concept of having a unique digital asset, while it is being used for a whole bunch of, of purposes that have no value at the moment, I still think there is some value which is going to be found there. Currencies is obviously the first one. And I think, you know, what you can argue about um, legitimately about the environmental impact of Bitcoin and Ethereum and others. But uh, the idea of having a unique digital currency, I think the application of that is going to end up being something which is incredibly useful for humanity in the long term. And the other part, third point I would make is specifically related to NFTs. You can, you can append a smart contract to this, which means that you can buy an asset, a unique digital asset, and then you can have derived future value from that in the form of sending them further images, further music, uh, further currency, whatever, as time goes on. And I think we're just at the beginning of starting to figure out what these applications are. And I think if you start from the premise of we have to have a problem to solve before we go this far, we're never going to see innovation. So I'm I'm on board. I mean, I'm not going to attend the conference, but, but I think that this... I think this can, can I push back on that, though? Because the, the principle of innovation, as I understand it, is to define your problem and then work through ways of solving it. And if you are... The problem with a lot of these models is here is the innovation, now find a way of monetizing it. The other thing that just struck me while you were talking, Dan, and maybe throw this down, Web 1.0 was really a free network that people put their passion and energy into. Web 2.0 was characterized by, um, you know, venture capitalism and raising capital to to build the next thing that would take the web. This seems to be a total decentralization of risk down to individuals in the form of potentially a Ponzi scheme. So even the risk of the investment is being driven effectively to vulnerable individuals rather than informed investors or in the first instance, a government platform that people played on. Is that 
Is that fair? Yeah, look, it could be that, but I just think, I don't think it, that's all it's going to be. And in fact, I think that's going to end up being the minority. I mean, you know, Web 1.0, obviously read only, Web 2.0, read write, Web 3.0, unique digital assets that people can own and trade. I just think that the applications are going to come from that. I'm not smart enough to think about what they are at this point, but my hunch is I think that we're going to end up in a circumstance where having unique digital assets and the ability to do things with those assets, as I said, such as derive future value, create future assets that can then be passed on to the unique owner of that asset. I think that that's going to end up having a whole bunch of applications which are going to end up being really useful. There'll be a whole bunch of, of trash and scams and things that come with it. And I take your point. Pete, Web 2.0, the companies that emerged were largely Silicon Valley companies that emerged and, and those people got rich, whereas Web 3.0 is decentralized. And therefore, there is the potential for a whole bunch of individuals to be exploited in a way that wasn't the case perhaps with Web 2.0. But I don't know if I even buy the decentralization argument of Web 3.0, to be honest, too much. I think that sounds a little bit too optimistic. I just think that, that at the core of this, unique digital asset that you can do things with in the future is going to end up having value that we haven't realised yet. Fire at will with Lizzie. There's a whole episode, I think, where we could spend time talking about what what is the what is the perfect climate for innovation or what's the ideal way in which innovation happens? How can we create a culture of curiosity? How can we give people the space to explore new innovations? And th- I, I think that's a legitimate um, pursuit. That's not what I see here. What I see is people pursuing monetization um, over innovation. And, okay, sure, your argument may be valid in the sense that we might eventually get some kind of actual practical use case for this technology I've no doubt about it um, but we may also get a bunch of predators in the interim using it for their own purposes you know there's lots of discussion on smart contracts that are, I think are particularly problematic like how you could you know if you stop making a car payment and then you disable the car uh, if that's a uh, through a self-executing smart contract this does create potential problems for um, consumer rights and things like that but it does it does uh, serve the very powerful companies that might be selling us these things and making use of this technology and that's a micro example of I think where these kinds of innovations go when when monetization is the priority over a generalizing innovation and so I'm up for seeing the good uses of this, but I also think it's reasonable to criticise the early stage monetization, which might crowd out some of those better uses and 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 uh, clamp down on the culture of creativity and curiosity that that would otherwise uh, accelerate those use cases. And one final point, like the train of technological development is shaped by the culture that it emerges from and a culture of individual um speculation is inherently different than a culture of civil engagement or joint joint purpose and that's where i get really stuck in the whole culture that you see in in um things like the nft fest i'm sure they're all lovely people and they'd be great to have a drink with and talk about how the world's going to be in the future but as a group the future is about realizing the money rather than anything bigger than that and that's what feels icky to me there's a there's a flip side to that we probably need to move on but it's last point the, the flip side to that though is there is a, a a big part of the culture or or the the bet if you like that a lot of these people are making is that web3 is going to enable individual creators uh to be able to derive more value from the work that they do than is currently the case with mm. Web 2, where it's dominated by these very large Silicon Valley companies, which are, which are reaping all of the benefits from the creativity mm. of, of individuals. Yeah. That, again, I, as I said before, I'm not sure I buy that, but I think that's a nice place to start. Yeah. I think that's a nice place to start. So maybe it won't end up being yeah. as bad as what you and Libby think. And maybe rather than just being mean about them, we should invite some of the organisers on one week before the, the conference to sort of get their view of the world as well. Like I, I am conscious that it was almost like a cheap shot there, but um, there you go. That's what we think about NFTs. Two to one, if we had the minty <laughs> up at the moment, Dan. Let's move into the deep dive and invite our special guests for this um, episode, Amy Brownbill from FAIR and Nicholas Carra from the School of Communications and Art at the University of Queensland. They are part of a group who have put out a report on 
dark advertising, in particular the opacity around the way that the major platforms handle their advertising. So we'll um we'll get you guys just to take us through your findings, then obviously we'll kick things around. Welcome, Nick, and thanks for joining us. We've already said hello to Amy a bit earlier. Amy, do you want to kick off with us by like so FAIR is focused on alcohol research and education why did you sort of latch on to this as a project for your organization and then we'll bring nick in on what we found out great sure um so as you just said fair um is an organization that is working towards australia free from alcohol harm um and to do this we undertake a wide set of policy research and health promotion work and one of these areas that we're focusing on at the moment is digital marketing of alcohol um, in terms of what we know, which sort of sets the background for why this is an important area, um, we know that alcohol advertising increases positive perceptions and preferences for alcohol products, um, as well as leading to higher use of alcohol products. And we know that when it comes to children, their exposure to alcohol advertising also increases their likelihood that they will initiate using alcohol at a younger age and that they'll go on to drink at more risky levels. Um, and we also know that there's a lot of alcohol marketing that's being disseminated online and that digital marketing brings this new level of risk um, that we're going to get into uh, today. So I won't sort of speak too much about that um, now. So we're undertaking a big program of work that's really trying to get a better understanding of the digital marketing landscape and what alcohol marketing looks like in this landscape. Um, as well as potential regulatory pathways that will help reduce harm from alcohol marketing online. We know that the, um, you know, the mainstream advertising really clamped down on um, alcohol, um, particularly around sponsoring of sports events. You know, we used to have the Fosters Melbourne Cup and every sports event was VB or something like that. So what we're talking about here is not straight advertising. It's more different approaches to get advertising in front of kids. Right, Amy? Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, what we used to see is that advertising was put out in ways that was um, really observable to the public. You know, we could see when alcohol advertising is happening on TV or if it's happening on billboards. But when we enter the online space, a lot of it's happening under the radar. So this is really problematic for holding companies account for their marketing practices, especially when um, they could be particularly harmful, such as uh, marketing directly to children. All right. So, Nick, you went under the bonnet. What did you find? Yeah, I, what we found is, um, well, I mean, the, the kind of paradox of the present moment is, you know, at the very moment where we become unbelievably visible to advertisers and marketers, they, they become invisible to us. And so what we've been noticing is platforms really talk up their ad transparency efforts. Like we're making, you know, that's we're making the 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 ad activity on our platforms easier for the public to monitor and so on and so we wanted to come and test out their rhetoric basically so we took the major platforms facebook instagram uh youtube google um tiktok snapchat twitter um and basically asked ourselves a series of questions which was you know different versions of can you find the ads do they create an archive of ads that you can search do they store the ads do they give you information on the ads like the spend the targeting the reach um, and what we found really is that um, every platform failed on every criteria just about. Um, the only exceptions were that um, some platforms responding mostly to pressure in the US have started to make political advertising more transparent. Um, but but for, for any other ad category, they, they provide nearly nothing. Um, and that, that's a kind of interesting finding in the sense that it shows us there's no technical barriers to platforms offering um, transparency, but, but it's merely a kind of, you know, the will to do it. Um, and I guess I'd say that, you know, for us, transparency is not an end in itself. Um, it's an important piece in the mix. So if you could make digital advertising more transparent, it's easier for civil society organisations and others to observe what's happening. And that's just you know, the basic ingredient of any kind of accountability that we might imagine for advertising. So you've you've published a, a traffic light. Um, there's very few green. Um, it looks yeah, like TikTok's, I think one green square. <laughs> yeah. It, um, so maybe explain that. And then obviously TikTok has sort of scooped the pool with um, all reds. Um, but was yeah. there was there anything that surprised you when you went looking? 
Um, I guess what surprise I guess this is what surprises me the most in some of these debates is we spend a lot of time talking about how bad Facebook is. Um, and it's not that they're not bad. Like, I mean, well, you know, they got the only green square in the sense that they're the only platform that offers a searchable dashboard of the ads that are currently running live on the platform. Um, the weird thing about their transparency tool is that only ads that are live. So it's 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 sort of like, do you know, it's like a library that 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 throws out all the books people aren't currently reading or something, do you know? Mm-hmm. Um so, but they're the only one that offers you something where you can go and search. Um, but but TikTok, um, oh, sorry, in terms of what surprises me, is that like Google's really, really bad. <laughs> like um, that, that all that makes Google better than TikTok um, is that they've offered some basic transparency tools around political advertising. Um, and do you know, they're, they're with, with Meta, one of the, now the, one of the biggest advertising companies mm. in the world. So this is a kind of, like what makes this surprising to me in a historical sense is, do you know, we've, advertising a fundamental feature of advertising in the 20th century is that it's a public form of communication it's publicity it's public it's a public cultural form and so all our forms of accountability law and so on are based on that that um premise if you like that that's what advertising is and in the last 10 years really um advertising has kind of been completely converted into um a a kind of non-public form of communication um, and that's that's just that yeah. should be hugely surprising to us, you know. Um, yeah. but, but Belinda's asked the question that I was going to ask as well, which is what is the definition of political? Um, my understanding is that when the platforms do do anything around political, it's only formal ads from political parties. So there can be a lot of political content that's boosted on their platforms that goes totally under the radar. Although I know B also works um, in the climate space, and I, I guess she's interested in how activist content is treated on those platforms as well yeah good question so they they tend to describe it as politics issues and i forget their terminology but they so so there is a kind of gray zone that the each of the platforms operate slightly differently um uh and then and therefore they they kind of basically categorize particular kinds of organizations as as political so it's 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 not just political parties yeah, Sorry, yeah. interrupting there because that 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 categorisation in itself is a problem in our experience. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Uh, at the Guardian, for example, we we run programmatic advertising, as I think uh, most people would know. And um, but we actually have we we do accept political advertising, but because political advertising uh, tends to uh, so often delve into areas that are untrue, we require we have to pre-approve it before we will accept it. So we've got a, a blanket ban, if you like, on on political advertising appearing on our site via programmatic so that we have the opportunity to better than make sure that what is being said and said in the ads is true i won't say who but I'm, I'm sure everyone can think of a few political ads which aren't true which ran in the last uh, campaign. so um but the issue that we found was that even with this ban in place where we had a so-called political ban against it we still found political ads appearing on our site relatively frequently it was like a game of whack-a-ball and really it was i mean sometimes i think it was deliberate where people were deliberately Categori- miscategorizing their ads so that they could appear on sites like The Guardian or any other publisher. But in some cases, it was just an accident. And so we had ads appearing on our site that we didn't want, I think just because someone had failed to tick the box appropriately when they were running, setting up their campaign with Google or anyone else. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you find that? I mean, is that, is that yeah. a, it seems like a widespread problem to me in my experience. Have, have you found many issues of that in, in your investigations? Yeah, so definitely with political ads, but you also get it with other, you know, protected or categories of concern, alcohol advertising, gambling, pharmaceuticals and so on. The, the platforms, you know, there, there are two mecha- mechanisms there for, for categorization. And it, it begins with the advertiser, you know, disclosing that they are a political advertiser, an alcohol advertiser, and that's sort of just something that they might choose to do or not to do if they're you know, if they're wanting to game the system or or they might just forget or whatever. Um, and then the other way that it might get picked up is it is through the kind of automated controls the platform might introduce around, say, particular keywords or topics um, that their kind of automated scanning of ads might flag an ad for review and then take it down. So, but again, that's kind of strange around, I mean, if you imagine the case of the newspaper or the television station publishing ads that no human has actually had a look at, you know, to see if it complies with their editorial policies. This is this is kind of where we're at with with platforms this gets and, at the and, heart, and programmatic think. markets more generally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this this gets at the heart of the problem. I think um, to your point, Nicola. Yes, moderation is hard, um, but mm. it's especially hard when you you effectively have 
no controls over this or, or very limited controls over this where anyone can create an ad and target it to an audience and uh, there's no human oversight on that before it goes live. To, to your point, Nicholas, this is a relatively new concept. Now, I should make the point right. <laughs> um, that the vast majority of advertisements that run are completely appropriate and fine, uh, in our experience, at least on The Guardian. But mm. you never really know. One of the things that we've been calling for at, at, at The Guardian and many other people have as well is we just need, as a starting point, we need more transparency in how digital advertising works. At the very least, we need an archive so that we can go back and look at what has run right. so we can determine whether or not there's a problem. And to your point, there isn't an archive that exists currently. So how, right. how can you even start to police this? This, this is this right. like a pretty tough challenge. So, so yeah. to, aim, to Amy's interest, it's not just about political ads. It's also about who is receiving what advertising. So if you've got an organisation saying we're not going to, you know, put children in front of advertising how do you actually prove that that's where you're going isn't it Amy yeah definitely um and just going back to what was just talked about in terms of you know a platform might have a policy so if we take TikTok for an example you'll see on our uh, scorecard that they uh, absolutely failed when it comes to advertising transparency but they do have a policy that they won't allow alcohol advertising but there's no way for us to really ensure that that's not happening or to hold them accountable for that because there is no form of publication of the ads that are being put out there. And um, you know, as was just said, you know, anyone could be publishing content that is advertising alcohol. Um, and then picking up, I guess, on what's really of concern to us around um, the programmatic advertising systems, because we know that these are being designed and used by large digital platforms in a way that you know, by design, they're aimed to identify people who are most likely to make a purchase and to spend higher amounts when doing so. So, you know, buying more products who then become the core target for advertisements. So when we consider that in the context of harmful and addictive products like alcohol, this means people with the highest alcohol use would be the ones that are targeted with alcohol advertising the most. Um, and again, Same with gambling, any- you'd imagine, like sports yeah. gambling, right? Right. Right. Definitely. Yeah, the same the same issues because you know w- without any information we about what is happening with these advertising models by the way they're designed you know we're really concerned that they are targeting people who are at high risk of alcohol harm um, and this includes people who are you know experiencing or in recovery from alcohol addiction and yeah it definitely applies to other sort of addictive areas as well like gambling. I, I can't stop thinking about this in legal terms, though, because I am a lawyer, I suppose. But, um, you know, to my mind, it just seems obvious that you could say that these platforms have an obligation to ensure that ads are not seen by, Henry. <laughs> by people, people <laughs> under a certain age if they're from a, set, a category of, of, of predatory products, you know, like alcohol and gambling should not be shown to, to, to users of this platform under 18. One of the things that boggles my mind about this kind of research is all this knowledge is within the uh, company's um, right. domain. They know exactly what is going on and right. they choose to know, do, not do anything about it. And sometimes they know that it's harmful. They don't care. But, you know, they know what kind of ad categories are being created, even if they're automated. They know exactly what the ads look like, even if they're, again, not not reviewed by a human before they're published. That is unacceptable. Like it's not as though some, a kid accidentally walks past a, um, a billboard with gambling advertising. <laughs> Anyway, um, <laughs> I, 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 but you get my point. There is the capacity to le- to deal with this legislatively, right? Yeah, and I think maybe one of the reasons we we maybe haven't is, do you know, with any kind of other ad regulation that we might have had in the past, you didn't need to say the ads need to be in the public domain because by definition they were. And so that's that's a kind of, do you know, that's just a new feature of advertising that we need to kind of regulate for if we're going down that path. Um, the, the age one is interesting um, on two fronts. One, one is um, how to deal with, say, a category like age or a category like gender or other, other aspects of someone's identity without um, without verification, because there are good reasons why we don't want platforms verifying our ages. Um, and that's where they've kind of, I think, used that to their advantage. Um, and the other thing that you're starting to see them do is make preemptive moves. So, um, you know, like in the last year, Facebook or Meta more broadly has turned off any kind of targeting of children under 18 on any other criteria other than age, gender, location. Um, and, and, you know, they present that as protecting children, but I think um, it's actually something that platforms can begin to do now that a decade into their model, they've got enough proxy data not to need 
um, to target children like that anymore. Their models, it can learn from just watching children rather than needing advertisers to kind of target them on what we might think of as protected categories. So there's this kind of, um, do you know, the model is racing ahead of where some of our understandings, understandings of it are, I suppose. We could that have like itself. a system of opting out and stuff like that, of, or, or of preemptive opting out, like all these kinds of yeah. things. Like none of, I guess, what just drives me up the wall about this is like we're we're kind of having to you're having you guys are having to spend resources researching this when you know we know right. this problem exists and it's solvable. And yeah. you know, it's not even yeah. just predatory industries. Like I keep thinking about that example of Google where they have automatic ad generated categories for ad, ads to be pl- published and you know there's things like nancy sympathizers was one of the automatic categories that was generated now yeah. you know google fixed the problem after it was brought to their attention but it required like a pro publica investigation and you know that just shouldn't shouldn't be permitted right it should be a you know it's a it's a solvable problem i suppose is my point sorry sorry dan i cut you off uh, that's okay. I kind of lost my train of thought now anyway. Um, oh, I was going to ask, I was going to make the point, which I, again, I suspect I'm about to have another pile on, at least from you, Lizzie, because you made the point that there are good reasons, Nicholas, for not wanting the platform to verify ages. And in all seriousness, I, I absolutely accept that there are some real downsides to that. I'm not, I'm not uh, saying there's not. I, I guess my question is, or my, my bias, if you like, is it feels like a lesser evil to me. It feels like a lesser evil to me to have required, I know we've talked about this previously, but we, to have some kind of um, verification which exists, which would then make it much easier for us to just say with certainty that, uh, and make it illegal to your point, uh, Lizzie, for some of these advertisements to appear on the screens of um, of children. Isn't that, wouldn't that go some way towards solving this, Nicholas? Wouldn't wouldn't that be a lesser evil than, than the circumstance that we have now? <laughs> I mean... It's complicated to borrow Facebook's <laughs> terminology. Um, it depends what you're talking about, Lesser. It, it depends. You, you know, you really have to think in a. You end up having to think in a granular way about who get who gets harmed if you force age verification on, and how's that going to work in practice. And so you're going to have a situation where where anyone under 18 to access these kinds of digital services is going to probably have to rely on their parents to verify their identity and then subsequently verify the identity of their children. And there are lots of children growing up in, like if you think about other things that have happened on the internet over the last two decades that we might think of as really, really good. Like think about a platform like Tumblr and everything that did for queer, non-binary, diverse kids of all kinds in the noughties and 2010s. Um, because it was an anonymous, easy to access place where they could create a space and find other people that were like them. And for many of those kids, um, you know, living in family situations that weren't affirming of their experiences, their identities and so on. So like what happens if to use Tumblr, those kids needed to have their parents, you know, verify their age and identity. Um, Mm. So, you know, like, so I think that's where, you know, that's where the harms kick in, you know. Fair point. I I guess bringing it back to your report, I I think, what would be helpful, and perhaps this is what you're calling for, what, what would be helpful is, apart from transparency around what ads are running, transparency around the targeting that exists on those ads would at least right. enable us to see whether it was taking place, right? So perhaps that is a, a, a more logical first step than than, um, than what I was yeah. suggesting before. Isn't, isn't the alternative, Dan, that there's no advertising of uh, particular <laughs> kinds of industries on social media platforms? Like, I, I think money right. talks, that's part of it, right? I mean, I don't know if you put a view on this, Amy, but I know that Sportsbet, for example, spends half a billion dollars on advertising, I think, every three years in digital spaces. They're like, so, okay, these platforms are making a lot of money from them, but Maybe the safest way to avoid the problems of age verification and the problems of targeting children is to not permit this kind of advertising. Like, you know, like tobacco. Some you know, countries with... don't have advertising, Lizzie. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Just, I don't know. Amy do, you, Amy, do you have a view on that? Am I being silly? Yeah, no, it's definitely a good question. And, you know, because our discussion has sort of naturally gone towards talking about children and protecting children, and, you know, that is really important. But even if we had measures where children weren't seeing the alcohol advertising online, that's only part of the problem. As I was sort of talking about before, there's a real concern about other um, audiences as well that might be harmed by this content online. So if we're looking at measures that are just focused on children, you know, they are really limited. There's still a lot of harm that can be happening through this advertising. So it's not a crazy idea, Lizzie. Just to round out this, Nick, um, obviously we're playing catch up. We've got platforms that have built their business on advertising and we're trying to rebuild some safety into it. If you were starting from scratch, what would be the framework that you would want to see? No, oh, that's a good question. Um, look, I think that um, if, if you're starting from scratch, uh, you, you, you want, 
accountability built into it from the from the get go. And this kind of advertising is dark in two ways. So one is that you can't see the ads. So I think if you're starting from scratch, then if you're publishing ads on the platform, they need to be publicly visible. And then the other part of the darkness is is the the targeting that's going on, um, the learning of preferences and so on. And I and I think that um, that needs to be visible, and then you need to have controls around it. And some of those controls should be baked in at the individual level, like being able to choose not to have your personal information used in the ad model, being able to choose not to see particular kinds of ads or particular categories. But then some of the some of the controls need to be at the more social level. So if you're thinking about an addictive commodity like alcohol, um, one of the things we've noticed in our research is um, when we've asked people to donate to us their ad interests, which is like the bag of words that Facebook generates about you as you use their services, and we found in, in some of the small studies, we've been doing a kind of a kind of correlation um, between the alcohol-related words in their ad interests and their level of alcohol consumption. So the more alcohol they consume, um, the more alcohol-related preferences they have in the ad model. And it suggests that the ad model can effectively learn who the high-volume consumers of mm. alcohol are without ever asking them, you know, how much do you drink? Mm. Um, yep. And so that kind of thing, you know, that that suggests to me that around some kind of commodities, there is no safe version of this model because it's it's baked into its design to um, disproportionately target high volume consumers of those, of that product. Mm. The the, um, the other piece there is on the micro targeting and political advertising, in particular. The problem is that different groups are getting different messages and no one's seeing the whole picture so it really breaks down that idea of um a democratic conversation because you can just kind of retail it out and there is no transparency at the end of that line but it strikes me that's kind of the same problem with gambling and alcohol and everything really isn't it yeah yeah i think you're right i think we've we've paid an outsized attention in in my view to political advertising because do you know, in, in some ways, political advertisers aren't really the best users of these models. Anything they 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 do, they've learnt by watching the alcohol industry, the gambling industry, and so on. Um, that's where the innovation is. So I think sometimes responding to them means we're responding to to a kind of you know a version of this marketing that's not, in a sense, the most harmful version that's going on, or the most sophisticated version that's going on. It's so interesting. I think it's just yeah. well, I, I'm just really surprised at how sophisticated online advertising is for as somebody who pays attention to this or you know has a lot of concerns that I think are relatively nuanced about the impact on democracy and the like. It, it is a whole machinery that is extremely sophisticated and constantly updating itself, and the problems are so far reaching that I, I do think um, a heavy regulatory hand is on in the on balance preferable to um letting this continue it, it, it is where i land like not not you know if we're talking can about I, harm versus reward like can, it, I, can it, I just make one last thing though lizzie the other problem though is it's so damn effective so if we are trying to build we're, we're running a campaign on community housing at the moment we're trying to find somewhat people that are on the waiting list fifty thousand in new south wales 10 year wait the only way you can go and find is by targeting ads out to people. Mm. So and I guess Dan would make a similar point that mm. there's all the downside, but until there is something better, that is the only real tools to Yeah. To use. Yeah. Yeah. But I'd also yeah. make another point and that is that I think sometimes the benefit of targeting is overblown. I think yeah. that's that there's been this sort of narrative which is formed, which is all digital advertising has to be targeted advertising. And it's just not true. It's just not yeah. true. You can go back to just taking a sponsorship in the sports section or taking a sponsorship of the music section or whatever else. And those ads can be uh, really effective. It's often a different kind of advertising. It's often for people building brand, but I think sometimes we go a long way down this targeting funnel and, and it's it's not necessarily proved to be more effective than than, than perhaps people would have us believe. And I'll just make one last point if I could. I, I absolutely accept your point uh, that you made, Nick, or perhaps it was you, Amy, about the fact that political advertising is sort of downstream of these other larger problems. The, the one that the obvious example of this, though, where political advertising, where it was a problem, was Cambridge Analytica, which is obviously a Guardian story. But I just make one last point. We still don't really know the harm that was caused by Cambridge Analytica because we still don't know what ads were run to what people. We've got some insight from the fantastic reporting of, of Carol Cabalaga, but we, we don't really know the impact. And again, I guess it comes back to that point that you made at the start, which is transparency really needs to be the beginning of this. And, and then we can go from there. Fantastic discussion, mm-hmm. guys. Um... Thanks for joining us today. We're, we're kind of up to the hour. Um, look forward to seeing what comes of this research and 
the more work you're doing in this space, Amy, keep us in the loop because um, fantastic to see more organisations, you guys, Choice, um, a bunch of organisations that exist in a public interest starting to jump on on the journey we've been on for some time now, which is how we hold these platforms to account. Um, Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, everyone. You've been listening to Burning Platforms, a fortnightly podcast from the Australia Institute's Centre for Responsible Technology. It was recorded live at a virtual town hall on September 16. If you'd like to attend one of these discussions in real life, you can register at centreforresponsibletechnology.org.au. Burning Platforms was produced on Gadigal land by Jennifer Macy. Talk again in a fortnight.